The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt him back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to Episode 7 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we are diving into one of the Avengers' greatest enemies with the mighty Avengers meet the Masters of Evil in Avengers number 6. This issue is written by Stan Lee, pencils by Jack Kirby, inks by Schick Stone, who is a newcomer, and letters by Sam Rosen. And the book was published in July of 1964. So this is the first of the books when Avengers becomes a monthly title instead of a bi-monthly title. So that's a change for us as well. So right off the bat, I gotta say that this cover is even better than the last cover. I once again got a lot of action. This time, however, the characters are a little more on model. There's a little more fine detail in the characters. So if you remember from last issue, we left off with the Avengers getting an emergency message from the Teen Brigade. And this issue actually starts off with the Avengers making their way back from the Southwest, and they've had a stop off in Chicago. So it's a little bit of a discontinuity here. We will actually see the Team Brigade emergency message a little bit later in the issue, but things don't quite pick up exactly as you would expect them to, given the way the last issue ended. We do get a nice start, though, with this issue, and that we see Cap showing off some improvements to his shield that Iron Man has made. Iron Man has put some magnets in Cap's gauntlets and some, for lack of a better, technology into Cap's shield. And so Cap can basically make the shield just come right back to him using the magnets and, of course, transistors. Now, while the team is discussing all the things that Iron Man has done to Cap's shield... Cap unfortunately gets a little nostalgic and a little sad about Bucky. He talks about how much he wishes that Bucky were around and how much he'd love to show Bucky this really cool technology. And he just, he can't because, you know, Bucky's gone. Again, little does Cap know Bucky's not, but we still got about mm, four decades before we're going to hit on that. We also get the first mention of Iron Man's nickname of Shellhead in this issue. At least the first Avengers mention. We also get Rick Jones having really bad timing. So while Cap is all sad and depressed, Rick comes up to him and starts talking, hey, you know, we kind of talked about me maybe being a sidekick, and it's just, you kind of want to go, Rick, it's not the time. I know you're trying to help. You're 17 and you don't quite get it, though. This This is not the moment for you to come talk to Cap. Of course, like we said, Cap is sad because of what happened to Bucky and how much he misses Bucky. On top of that, though, Cap swears revenge on the man who killed Bucky, whomever they are. Of course, this being a comic book, we're immediately going to cut to the man who killed Bucky, and that is Baron Heinrich Zemo. And we see Baron Zemo hiding out in the South American jungle, where he has basically set himself up as some kind of emperor to a native people. And we get introduced to Zemo through the eyes of a pilot who makes a yearly supply run to Zemo, bringing him again various supplies, but also scientific journals, because the hood that Zemo wears has been glued to his face. And we find out that Captain America is responsible for Zemo's effectively disfigurement. We get a nice little flashback to World War II where we see Zemo as a Nazi scientist, shocking that he escaped to South America, and Captain America throwing his shield, hitting a vat of this stuff called Adhesive X, which splatters all over Zemo's face and adheres the hood to Zemo. I gotta say, I really enjoy the art around Zemo, although, I mean, his costume is a little ridiculous. He's got the hood, this kind of purple jumpsuit-looking thing, and the crown, and everything's, like, trimmed with Dalmatian fur, some kind of fur. It kind of looks like Dalmatian fur. But what what's really cool is... The way Jack Kirby does his face behind the mask and that you just kind of barely see the outline of eyes and nose and a mouth. And it's almost, you know, I really want to say like spectral or ghostly, you know, there's a man behind the mask, but you don't ever see his actual face. It actually served, I think, to both humanize and dehumanize Zemo. You feel bad for Zemo being stuck under this mask for so long, even though he is obviously the villain. At the same time, the fact that you can't make out any details of his face and that he is this kind of spectral figure really makes it hard to relate to him on a lot of levels. 
I also want to point out for those who are more familiar with Captain America comics, especially more modern runs, is that this is not the same Baron Zemo we will see later on. This is Baron Heinrich Zemo, who is the father of Baron Helmut Zemo. And that's the Zemo we are more familiar with, the one who'll be in Thunderbolts, the one who's the long-running Captain America villain. The other thing I want to comment on here is that back in episode number four, we talked about how Namor was kind of dismissive of indigenous persons. Zemo, on the other hand, is not only dismissive, he's exploitive and downright oppressive and cruel. When our pilot reaches Zemo, Zemo commands him to stand still, and Zemo walks on the backs of all of his people so that his feet don't touch the ground. You know, it's one thing in the panel before that, it's one that he's being carried on a litter. And while, yes, that is kind of a messed up image in terms of placing himself above other persons, you know, historically, that's not an uncommon image for kings or even just the rich. You know, in Rome, it was not uncommon for rich persons to be carried on a litter through the streets. Walking on the backs of persons so that your feet don't touch the ground, so that you're unsoiled, unsullied, that's a whole nother level of messed up. So I understand that they're they're trying to portray Zemo as this, this super evil person that that he has such disregard for human life and human rights. I think they go a step too far though. Now, Baron Zemo flies into a rage at the end of this scene because he discovers that Captain America is still alive. And that that's actually the point at which we get the flashback. I got a little ahead of myself a, a moment ago. But that Zemo discovers Captain America's alive, he has this flashback to how he got the hood stuck on his head, and then he mentions to the pilot that he thought he had killed Cap and killed Bucky back in the day. And then there's an editor's note to Avengers number four. So remember that little figure that was sitting in the corner while Cap and Bucky were jumping their motorcycle towards the drone plane? That was Zemo. I told you he would come back. In order to get his revenge on Cap, knowing that Cap is now part of the Avengers, he orders his pilot to assemble a team of three individuals. And the pilot willingly agrees, mostly because Zemo has threatened his life. We finally now get to the point where we actually see the Teen Brigade message that was sent off at the end of the last issue. Like I said, this time the message is being sent when the Avengers are reaching uh, New York, specifically JFK Airport, whereas at the end of the last issue, the message reached them before they'd even left the Southwest. So, again, a little bit of discontinuity, but it doesn't have a huge impact on the story, realistically. We immediately get to see why the Team Brigade sent out this red alert, and we get our introduction to the Masters of Evil. So who are the Masters of Evil at this point? Because the Masters of Evil are much like the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and X-Men, in that it's kind of a rotating lineup of characters. So even to next issue, which also features the Masters of Evil, we'll see a change in the lineup. But this original lineup consists of the Black Knight... The Melter, and Radioactive Man, obviously in addition to Baron Zemo himself. So the Black Knight comes to us from Tales to Astonish number 52. He is Nathan Garrett, and he was an American who was caught by Ant-Man trying to sell secrets to the Red Chinese, quote-unquote. He managed to make bail and escape to somewhere in the Balkans, and he takes this opportunity to make himself a winged horse by manipulating DNA, and then adopts the persona of the Black Knight so that he can take his revenge on Ant-Man. And again, some of you who are more familiar with the Avengers know that the Black Knight at some point is actually going to become an Avenger himself. However, once again, not the same guy. In this case, uh, Nathan Garrett is the uncle of the man who will be the Black Knight in the Avengers. Next up, we have the Melter, who is Bruno Horgan, comes to us from Tales of Suspense number 47, and he's a business rival of Tony Stark's. So Tony discovers that Horgan was using some substandard materials and reported it to the government, and that cost Horgan all of his government contracts. So as he's leaving his factory in, dis in disgrace, he discovers a malfunctioning sensor machine that is melting some of the iron in the area. And so he uses this device to create himself a chess piece, takes on the mantle of the melter, and attempts to defeat Iron Man. And finally, we've got Radioactive Man. And no, this is not Radioactive Man from The Simpsons, much as it saddens me. There is no up and at them in that terrible, terrible Arnold Schwarzenegger accent. I, I may have to go find a clip of that just to amuse myself and put it in the show notes. Because, I mean, Radioactive Man of The Simpsons is pretty awesome. But no, this is Dr. Chen Lu, and he's from Journey into Mystery number 93. He's a Chinese scientist who is charged with finding a way to beat Thor after Thor interfered with the Chinese invasion of India. And that is an actually a real invasion. It was the Sino-Indian War of 1962. Basically a, a series of border skirmishes between the Chinese and Indians in the Himalayan uh, region. 
So Dr. Chen turned himself into Radioactive Man in order to defeat Thor and win a claim for himself from the Great Leader, who is basically a unnamed Chairman Mao. You, you actually see the character, and it's very much Chairman Mao. This particular issue is a little rough. Again, some some pretty harsh racial stereotypes. So the uh, Tales to Astonish 52 mentions the Red Chinese, and that's really just an allusion politically to the Chinese Communist Party, who at this point has taken over China. The Journey into Mystery 93, however, the art and the way the Chinese are portrayed is really only a step or two above the real exaggerated cartoonish look of the Japanese in World War II comics. And it, it's also kind of offensive. So in terms of race, we're not doing so so good this episode. I, w- I will point out Radioactive Man, I don't know if I would say he's more on model. It's much less stereotypical racist Chinese animation for Radioactive Man in this issue as compared to Journey into Mystery. So that there, there is an improvement there, but knowing where it's coming from, it's a little rough. So now that we've introduced the Masters of Evil, what the hell are they doing? I mean, they've been assembled by Zemo, so to what end? Well, that end happens to be that Zemo is spraying down, or Zemo has the the rest of the Masters of Evil, spraying down New York City with Adhesive X, the adhesive that has stuck Zemo's mask to his face for the last 20 years. And they are trying to draw the Avengers out. And specifically, Zemo has chosen these three individuals because of the enemies that Thor, Ant-Man, and Iron Man have faced in the past. These are the three that have come the closest to defeating their respective foes. So he figures that with these three individuals taking care of the rest of the Avengers, Zemo will be free to deal with Cap himself. Each of the three villains gets their own short little introduction. And one of the things I got to say about the Silver Age, as word heavy as the comics are, in instances like this, they give you a really good quick synopsis of who the people are, what they're here to do, and where they came from. In two pages, we get an introduction to Black Knight, Melter, and Radioactive Man. And if you didn't read any of the other issues that were that are referenced, you still understand enough about these guys so that you can continue on with the issue without being confused. You know, for all of its flaws, this is one of the things that Silver Age actually does really well, I think. I'm also starting to wonder if radiation has some kind of effect on Mjolnir. So while the Masters of Evil are spraying down Manhattan with Adhesive X, Thor tries to throw Mjolnir at Radioactive Man, and as it did in Journey to Mystery 93, it bounces right off. It's actually repelled. And if you'll remember the last episode, the Witch Doctor's radiation rod also had kind of an interesting effect when it came in contact with Mjolnir in that it turned Thor back into Donald Blake. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit more research into that one. I have found instances where Mjolnir has absorbed radiation or absorbed energy, things like that. But these two instances back to back kind of make me curious if there's a little bit more. And I just need to look into that a little bit more. So we'll, we'll see what we can find. I'll, I'll definitely get back to you guys on that one. Of course, you know, this wouldn't be a good comic book with a super adhesive unless some of our heroes get stuck. In this case, it is Captain America and Giant Man. The Avengers manage to free them in a manner of speaking, in that Iron Man frees the chunk of street they are attached to, and they manage to drag Cap and Giant Man down the street using a tow truck. And they look like they're water skiing, and in fact, the issue actually makes that kind of remark. Like, this is the kind of thing I I would expect to see on Jackass or on YouTube in modern times. You know, these two guys getting drugged behind a truck super glued to something. It, It does make for a really amusing image, though. Especially when you get Giant Man next to Cap, and Giant Man is, you know, literally twice Cap's size when they're both trying to hold on to this truck. So the Avengers are kind of forced to retreat here because, as I mentioned, these are, these are the villains that have come the closest to defeating each Avenger individually. So they really struggle with fighting them again. And it's not until Thor confronts Black Knight during the retreat that any of the Avengers really have any kind of success against any of these foes. So with the Avengers in retreat, Baron Zemo decides it's time for him to arrive on the scene. And of course, he comes bearing more adhesive X and he's here to direct the rest of the fight. And there's a great moment here where Radioactive Man says that they'd better hurry up before the Avengers find a solution for adhesive X. And Zemo has this moment where he goes, oh, I I never thought of that. And I just want to go, why not? You're supposed to be the best super scientist that Nazi Germany had. And you didn't think that maybe the Avengers would come up with a solution to this? That's slightly mind-boggling. Zemo actually has a couple of mind-boggling thoughts here. He also says, you know, if they find a solution that he can remove his hood and walk around like a normal man. This guy's been wearing this hood for 20 years. I feel like no matter what happens, even if it comes off, he's not walking around looking normal. 
I don't think that's how that works. When we cut back to the Avengers, it seems that they are on a similar page as our Masters of Evil in that they want to find a solution for the Adhesive X as well. Of course, Wasp remembers there's this guy out there named Paste Pot Pete. Yes, Paste Pot Pete. Say that three times fast. Say that once fast. It's not easy. Anyways, Paste Pot Pete is a master of all adhesives, and he's currently in jail after fighting the Human Torch, off in Strange Tales number 110. So Wasp calls up the police, asks to speak with Pete, and he absolutely agrees to help out, and it just so happens just so happens that he has a a super dissolver of his own that will probably take care of adhesive x so iron man takes off and goes and picks up the 55 gallon drum and he comes back to avengers mansion with this 55 gallon drum strapped to his back and i really just i have this great mental image Iron Man flies there, but the drum is too heavy for him to fly back. So he's got to strap it to his back and take the subway home. I don't know how many of you guys have ever ridden the New York subways. I have quite a bit in my life. And you see some really, really weird stuff there. But I don't know that I've ever seen anything that would be as weird as Iron Man with a 55-gallon drum of solvent strapped to his back. Just kind of standing there, and he's just waiting for a stop, and then he gets off. Like, it's just It's comically out of place, even for New York, the New York City subway. Now, once Iron Man returns, we quickly discover that Pete's super solvent does in fact dissolve Adhesive X. So the Avengers immediately start formulating a plan to take care of all this Adhesive X and all these poor stuck people. And obviously Captain America is the one who's coming up with the plan because, as I've mentioned almost innumerous times at this point, the team starts to coalesce around Cap and Cap becomes the de facto leader. He's the one who comes up with all the plans. So Cap comes up with a brilliant plan. Amazing plan. Don't fight the guy you fought before. The guy who almost kicked your butt, don't fight him. Fight someone else. I know, I know. Masterful stroke. It had taken me decades to come up with a plan like that. Hundreds of years, maybe. This is why Captain America is Captain America. The only real downside to Cap's plan is that it involves the Teen Brigade. Admittedly, though, that they are actually quite helpful in this issue. So Cap has the Teen Brigade go and swap out barrels of Adhesive X for barrels of this super solvent. And then Zemo and the other Masters of Evil distribute the canisters, thinking that they are Adhesive X, and they're going to go hose down some more people with glue. And much to their surprise, they're actually setting them free. In addition to the characters being surprised, we, there's a great two-thirds page panel of the surprised Black Knight spraying down this new not-adhesive X onto the crowd and not understanding why people are getting free. But it's just a really cool panel. It's got him in the middle on his flying horse, which is beautifully drawn. Really nice backgrounds, really nice action going on below. It, all in all, it's a really, really nice panel, I gotta say. I am a little concerned that everyone's totally cool with spraying people with this super solvent. I understand this super adhesive is some really bad stuff, but if anyone's ever worked around like industrial strength solvents, those are nasty. Like dissolving a body kind of nasty. Like you don't want to just go spraying people with this stuff. But nonetheless, that's what the Avengers and realistically the Masters of Evil are doing at this very moment. So in addition to their efforts to help save people, the Avengers are also implementing Cap's new strategy of facing off against different people. And you get a really great moment from Black Knight, the, the super good looking panel. And the next panel, he gets really confused because Thor's not supposed to be my enemy. And you just kind of go, well, yeah, did you guys really think they were going to pair off the way you wanted them to? Like as goofy as Cap's plan is... The fact that the Masters of Evil are effectively playing right into it just makes it that much funnier. Of course, the Black Knight breaks out his super ultra mega lance of I don't know what. But it's funny because he refers to it as his innocent looking lance. And innocent looking is never a phrase I would use to describe a lance. A lance is a weapon of war. It is an actual weapon. Innocent looking lance is that it's not a thing. Of course, a fight ensues, and we get a nice little bit of fighting between Thor and the Black Knight, but it ends kind of abruptly. All we get is, then with those ringing words, the Thunder God attacks. And the entire rest of their fight is off-panel, and I'm a little disappointed by that. I really wanted to see more of that fight. I mean, I understand we're limited by page number and, and whatnot, but, you know, we got a couple of good pages to start, and Thor's about to make his, his great comeback, and then we shift to off-panel. It's a tease is what it is. Don't tease me. Give it to me. Give it to me all. Give me all of it. So since Thor is fighting Black Knight, it's Ant-Man's turn to fight Radioactive Man. 
And, you know, we get the obligatory giant man, ant man back and forth. But we get something new. We get Avengers teamwork, like legit teamwork. So giant man gets himself behind radioactive man and then he shrinks down right as radioactive man is shooting a burst of radiation at him. And Iron Man pops up and holds a Stark Tech device designed specifically to deal with radioactive materials. And it wraps up Radioactive Man in a sheet of lead and then floats him up in a lead balloon. I don't really know how floating in a lead balloon works, but floating in a lead balloon and rapidly removes Radioactive Man from the fight. And Iron Man's all happy. And then Melter attacks Iron Man. Like the whole plan works out really well. Except for the part where Iron Man still has to fight the person he didn't want to fight. Of course, Iron Man, thinking quickly, manages to relatively easily disable the Melter using a fire hydrant. And we finally get to the confrontation between Cap and Zemo. And and realistically, I mean, this is the one that, you know, the whole issue has been built around. So Zemo is is getting ready to make his escape. And he's got a canister with with an X on it, right, that he put there himself. That'll come into play in just a moment. But he's got this canister and he's getting ready to leave. And then Cap Shield smacks it out of his hands. And the two of them get into a fairly quick but really wonderful fight. There's a couple of great panels. And and we're getting to a point where it's becoming easier and easier to actually visualize the physical action, the physical motions that the characters are going through in between panels. Especially there's a couple where Zemo tries to smash both hands into Cap. And then Cap kind of comes up and kicks Zemo in the chest while doing kind of a handstand deal. And I can actually visualize how the characters are moving in between the panels. And it's becoming really, really cool. So at this point, all of our villains have been dealt with, except for the most minor of villains, the unnamed pilot. And our unnamed pilot decides to take a shot at Captain America. He actually grazes Cap's head instead of getting a, a, a direct shot. And he's only prevented from killing Cap by the quick thinking of Ant-Man and Wasp, who throw a nail into his gun, which is enough to help deflect the bullet away from its intended target. At which point, Giant Man attempts to capture the pilot and pulls a Bill Buckley. Now, unlike Buckley, Giant Man eventually catches up with his quarry and turns him into the police, right about the time that Thor turns up with a defeated Black Knight and also hands him over to the authorities. And again, this is why I'm a little disappointed. Thor comes in riding Black Knight's horse with Black Knight being trailed alongside. And I really want to know, like, what happened? It seems like it would have been an interesting fight and we just don't deal with it. So at this point, everyone has been captured except for Zemo, who manages to make an escape. Zemo thinks he he made it his escape with a canister of solvent. But of course, that would be too easy, too good for him. So as part of Cap's plan, the Teen Brigade managed to swap out Zemo's specially marked canister with a canister of tear gas. And our second to last panel, you see Zemo's hella hover copter, I don't know, some kind of helicopter hover thing start wobbling in the sky. And Cap points out that he apparently just opened the can of tear gas and I really gotta say, I love that gag. It's very Saturday morning cartoonish, but it's not too much. It's goofy without being stupid. Especially for Silver Age comics, that's exactly what I want. I want these to be fun and lighthearted and kind of goofy, but I want them to stay away from the just plain stupid or offensive. That'll go ahead and finish off our issue in our wrap-up. One of the things I haven't talked about much before, and, and I'm a little remiss in doing so, I rip on Stan Lee's writing a bit here. But one of the things I think Stan does wonderfully is he uses a huge, wide, and interesting vocabulary. And I say this is a good thing because although in general nowadays we think of comics, they're really not necessarily for kids much anymore. These comics really kind of were aimed at younger readers, you know, probably early teens or so. And a lot of the words that Stan chooses to use are words that some of these guys are probably, guys and and, and gals, are probably not all that familiar with, and they would have to either figure out by context or have to go look up what they mean. You know, instead of playing to the lowest denominator when it comes to language, Stan's kind of raising the bar a little bit here, and I, I got to give him a lot of credit for that. I really think this is a great story to introduce a reoccurring foe in The Masters of Evil. It's also a good choice for a team enemy, especially when you compare it to a team like the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. All the members of the Masters of Evil existed outside of these book beforehand. So we don't have to waste a lot of time on exposition. Like I said, in two pages, 
We got a quick down and dirty. This is who they are. These are their powers. This is where they came from. Moving on. Whereas in like X-Men with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, we don't understand the characters all that well. And we have to spend several issues, several returns of these villains to even get the most fundamental explanation of who some of those characters are like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch and Mastermind and Toad. They really don't start taking any kind of definition until several issues in and that kind of exposition really detracts from the story overall whereas in a story like this because the characters are already established we already have origins for all of them and we can jump right into a story give a quick one to two panel explanation and then just keep moving forward with the story without having to take these detours for character explanation for enemies that may or may not be all that important individually as opposed to as a whole The Masters of Evil also provide a really nice mirror to the Avengers. You know, much like the Avengers themselves, the lineup is going to change over the years. We'll have, you know, it's going to change the next issue, and then we'll kind of have a a combined version up through the early 20s. And then we won't see the Masters of Evil again until issue 54, I think. And, well, again, we'll have some new faces and some old faces. We'll have them again for a few more issues. And then we won't see them again until somewhere in the 200s another 170 issues before we see the masters of evil again and the lineup will have changed yet again so much like the avengers who are rotating members in and out on a fairly regular basis so too will one of their more important foes when it comes to the art i mean again like i said last issue every issue to issue the art is improving in its consistency i think in this issue general art through the issue is again of a higher level but we also had more of those standout panels which was nice Yeah, the last issue, it was a strong issue in terms of consistency, but it didn't have those standout panels that make you go, wow, that's really, really cool. And this had several of those, so that was enjoyable. My only complaint, and it's a mix between story and art, really has to do with the fact that in in some cases we have action taking place off panel that I really would have liked to have seen. And I think those are just unfortunate missed opportunities. All right, so this week we have our first listener question, and it comes from Shadow WKW, and they write, who is the Avengers' most formidable foe early on in the series? So I actually, I had to do a little bit of thinking about this one. It started off as a toss-up between Kang the Conqueror, who we'll get to know in issue number eight, and the Masters of Evil, who we met in this issue. So while the Masters of Evil are probably the more immediately formidable especially once we add Enchantress and Executioner next issue. As I mentioned before, they tend to have more turnover in the team, so it's it's kind of inconsistent. Kang is also a much more powerful individual than pretty much any of the other Masters of Evil. Maybe not the Asgardians, but everyone else certainly. And you've also got to keep in mind, without digging too deep into this one, that when I talk about Kang the Conqueror, Kang is actually a number of different villains all wrapped into one Gordian knot of continuity. So he's also Ramatut, he's also Immortus, he's Iron Lad. Kang has so many personas throughout the Marvel Universe, it's kind of funny. So taking those into consideration also kind of makes Kang that much more formidable. In the long run, my money's definitely on Kang, but specifically answering the question, early on in the series, it's probably the Masters of Evil. They've got a number of appearances here early on, Uh, Once we do a little bit of the character swapping out and we get Enchantress and Executioner, the team is much stronger, much more effective. And quite honestly, we'll get Kang two or three times and Immortus once, and then we don't hear from him for quite a while. So early on in the series, he's actually much less involved than I had originally thought, to be honest with you guys. So Shadow WKW, I hope that answers your question. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And if you, like Shadow WKW, would like to be a part of the conversation, send your comments and questions to andrew at avengersassembly.com. Next week, we find the Avengers in their darkest hour in Avengers number seven. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, Let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.